Well, hi there and welcome to our Bible study on the Lighthouse Discord server on the book of John. We're on the latter part of chapter 11 today, but before we begin, let's open with a word of praise and a word of prayer. Father God, we give you thanks and praise, glory and honor that across the miles, across the continents, we can be together. We can share with each other we can study your word, we can be in your holy presence, and we can fellowship together because it's online. And God, there's a lot of things that are going on these days. We think especially of those missionaries in Haiti who were captured, Lord. It's thought that there's five children amongst them mostly Americans, but with one Canadian. And we know, Lord, that this situation looks bleak. It always does in these circumstances. But Father, you are the God of gods, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And you set Jesus here to be our king, to be our Lord. And so God, I pray for their deliverance. I pray for their protection and for their release, Lord, that they will be healthy, happy, and able to return to their homes, their families, and their daily lives, Lord. God, I pray for the needs on the server. There's many of them. A lot of people are feeling extreme stress and concern. There's a lot of people with various physical ailments, Lord, spiritual conditions. There's a lot of people, Lord, with mental health concerns, with stress and all kinds of things. Father, you really are all we really have to hold on to. And so I give every request to you with thanksgiving and with praise. Because I know, Lord, that even in the toughest circumstances, we can still praise your holy name because no matter what is going on, you are still almighty God. You're omniscient, you're omnipresent, you're omnipotent. You're everywhere. You know everything. You're all powerful. And so, Lord, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you that we can rest in you. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. All right. So we're on John 11. Starting at verse 47, <clears throat> excuse me. Therefore, the chief priests and the Pharisees convened a council and were saying, what are we doing? For this man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was a high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you take into account that it is expedient for you that one man die for the people and that the whole nation shall not perish. Now, he did not say this on his own initiative, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation and not for the nation only, but in order that it might also gather together into one, the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they planned together to kill him. Therefore, Jesus no longer continued to walk publicly among the Jews, but went away from there to the country near the wilderness into a city called Ephraim. And there he stayed with the disciples. Now the Passover of the Jews was near, and many went up to Jerusalem out of the country before the Passover to purify themselves. So they were seeking for Jesus 
and were saying to one another as they stood in the temple, what do you think, that he will not come to the feast at all? Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he was to report it so that they might seize him. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. So if you've lived very long, you've experienced at least one moment of truth, that sweet and terrible instant when the truth about some particular matter can no longer be denied or minimized or rationalized or disguised. There it is, in all its stark, unforgiving glory demanding a choice. You can bury the truth and then live in manic, strained denial for the rest of your days. Or you can submit to that truth and then rest in its freedom. Now I can think back, and I'd made a note here in, in the Swindoll book we're looking at, that the day that I knew my dad had pancreatic cancer and I couldn't do anything to help him except take him home to mom and make him comfortable. That was my reality. Today, as I sit and lead the study, I realize the fact that in one sense, I'm going through this yet again. My husband had a stroke Friday morning. It was a small one, yes, but he can't drive for six weeks. We've got many, many, many appointments coming up, the stroke clinic, the EEG clinic. Um, there's another one that he has to go to. We have to see the family doctor about whether he will be able to drive in six weeks again. But then we've also got the fact that his heart is wearing out and he's in heart failure. So we have the heart function clinic to manage medications and exercise and diet. But then we also, because he needs a new cardiac device and that's wearing out and they're hesitant now, it sounds like about putting that in right away because of the stroke but he kind of needs it to keep his heart going. So we've got an appointment tomorrow morning at this time for that. So we've got all these various teams of people at the hospital to look after his care. And we really don't know what's happening anymore. But you know what? I'm resting in the Lord. I don't have a choice. So. I can deny it and say that he'll survive or I can face the truth and say, I don't know how long I'll have him, but however long that is, praise God. So I say, I share these things because Swindoll says, if you have faced such a moment, you know as much as you try to find it, no compromising middle way will allow you to avoid the distressing consequences of either choice. Denial is a slippery slope leading to a quagmire of pretending and deception. Acceptance requires life-altering choices. It will cause intense pain for everyone involved. But at least with the truth, the pain is the healing kind. But that doesn't make the choice any easier. There's a young man that was living in my brother's basement suite who at one point was just making such poor, poor life choices. But 
he made a decision to carry on. Now, my brother since sold their home, and I don't know whatever happened with that young man, but you know, sometimes you just have to live with the truth. So King David experienced this moment of truth when the prophet Nathan stuck a bony finger in his face and said, you are the man in 2 Samuel 12, 7. By this act, the prophet exposed the king's secret sin and called him to account. And 2 Samuel 12, 7 to 9 goes, thus says the Lord of Israel, it is I who anointed you king over Israel. And it is I who delivered you from the hand of Saul. I also gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your care. And I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added to you many more things like these. Why have you despised the word of the Lord by doing evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the sons of Ammon. A-M-M-O-N. So David's moment of truth offered him two choices and only two. Silence the prophet permanently or repent. It was a choice between power and truth. And it could have become like his predecessor Saul who jealously clutched his power and wielded it to hunt down the Lord's newly anointed king. And we could look at 1 Samuel 16, 13 for that, hoping to murder him. But instead, David proved to be different from Saul. David was a man after God's own heart, according to 1 Samuel 13, 14, despite his awful sins. He chose to submit to the truth and then rest, in its inevitable reward, release from turmoil, freedom from fear, and eventually peace with God. You could look at Psalms 32 and Psalm 51. Now, the public ministry of Jesus was a three year moment of truth for the religious leaders of first century Israel. We need to understand this, friends. You see, the word of God who had been promised for centuries now stood before them in flesh and blood. Truth incarnate. Incarnate, by the way, means fully God and fully man. But they denied the truth. They disputed the truth. They marginalized the truth and even tried to silence the truth. But Jesus will not be set aside or put off. He leaves no compromising middle way. <clears throat> Sorry. Each individual must decide what to do with him. Deny or submit. Reject or believe. Embrace him and experience freedom or kill him and preserve the illusion of power. So after Jesus exercised power over death, many religious leaders began to break ranks and believe in the Son of God. And we talked about this last time in John 11, 45 and 46. Therefore, the custodians of religious power in Jerusalem in Psalm 82 could not, or sorry, could no longer put off the question of Jesus. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in verses 47 to 48, we learn, by the time of Jesus, the Jews had instituted what may be considered a provisional government in anticipation of the Messiah, who would rule as king. And until then, they vested the high priest with all the rights and privileges of a monarch, which is talked about in 1 Maccabees 14, 35 to 49, which is not a book in the traditional Bible, but I believe it's in the Apocrypha, but certainly it's an, a, an, a historical account. But <clears throat> the point is, 
that with the understanding that he should step aside when the Christ came to claim his rightful place on the throne of Israel. Except during the reign of Herod the Great, who had himself named king of the Jews by Rome, the high priest traditionally guided the nation as its provisional leader. And throughout its history, Israel also looked to a body of elders for day-to-day -day leadership, a council known as the Sanhedrin, which served as both parliament and Supreme Court. And this ruling council of 70 learned men set Jewish policy within limits established by Rome and ruled on civil and criminal court cases. Now, I just want to make a note here. Do you see how important religion or belief was as far as the government went, as far as society went? So, 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 so different from today. Now, but listen, <coughs> excuse me. The Sanhedrin placed a high importance on maintaining that uneasy balance between Rome's desire to dominate its subjects and the yearning of the Jewish people for independence. Now, normally the high priest who was appointed by Rome and the Sanhedrin who advocated for independent-minded Jews engaged in kind of a public rivalry each pretending to work against the other, yet neither really wanting anything different. Because change of any kind would necessarily strip everyone of power. Now, we don't normally talk about politics on the server. And so I'm not really going to talk about it much, but I wonder if anyone else sees that in your local government because i do in ours they all talk especially because we just had an election not that long ago and nothing really changed much but the reality is they all talk big talk about changing policies and implementing procedures and things and yet year after year after year and i've been on this earth now for quite a lot of decades the fact is that not a whole lot changes. People are afraid to implement something radical, especially when it comes to Christianity, would be unheard of. But the council met in order to decide what to do with Jesus. He bore all the scriptural credentials and produced all the right signs of the Messiah. Yet, he lacked an army. So to side with Jesus as they understood the role of the Christ was to defy Rome. But to defy Rome without an army was to inv invite the worst kind of death. Roman generals were known to line the roads of rebel cities with the crucified bodies of its men and women and to sell their children into slavery. Talk about horrific acts. Then in verses 48 to 52, we learn that throughout much of its history, the high priest presided over the Sanhedrin, acting as its moderator and official voice, but that practice ended about 200 BC when the council felt the need for a balance of powers. And so at that time, they created the office of NASI, N-A-S-I, to preside over the council and the offices of Av-Bet-Din, <coughs> A-V-B-E-T-D-I-N, head of the House of Law to preside over matters involving the law. And at the time of Jesus, the Nasi was a descendant of the legendary Jewish teacher Hillel, H-I-L-L-E-L. -L -E -L. So for the high priest to attend a special meeting of the Sanhedrin was not unprecedented, 
but it did suggest something extraordinary was occurring, much like the president of the US attending a special meeting of Congress. The high priest that year was Caiaphas, the corrupt son-in-law and figurehead of the true power in the temple, Annas, A-N-N-A-S. When Caiaphas heard the debate, he issued an unwitting prophecy. While he was not a genuine man of God, he spoke a profound truth by way of irony. He merely suggested they make Jesus the fall guy if Rome should seek someone to blame for the agitation of the crowds. John takes the statement of Caiaphas and points to the theological truth of Jesus' substitutionary death for the sins of believers in Israel and of Gentile nations abroad. Note John's emphasis on response. Those who hear and respond in belief are gathered into one and called children of God. Please understand, friends, if you have prayed and repented of your sin and turned to Christ and invited him into your life as your Lord and Savior, and you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, rose again three days later, ascended into heaven, and will be returning for you, then you are a child of God. You and me. Now, by the end of the meeting, the religious leaders decided on their official disposition concerning Jesus. Submitting to the truth would require them to cede their powers to the Messiah, which they refused to do. Therefore, because they would not accept the truth, they officially decided to kill him. Verses 54 to 57. You see, the exact location of the town Ephraim had been lost to history, or has been lost to history. However, the name may refer to Ephron, an ancient site near present-day El Tayaba. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. That's E-T-T-A-I-Y-I-B-E-H, which is about a day's walk northeast of Jerusalem. Jesus avoided contact with the religious officials for the time being, though not out of fear. He simply had no need for further discussion. You see, the die had been cast. The breaking point had been reached, the point of no return. Each man associated with the official powers of the nation had made up his mind one way or the other. And the next time Jesus would encounter the religious authorities of the temple, it would be in an official capacity. Soon he would enter Jerusalem as King Jesus, the Messiah, arriving to claim the throne of Israel and to assume command of his people. So the application here from Chuck Swindoll is this. <coughs> Excuse me, he writes, as a young man, I listened with great confusion to sermons and lessons on the life of Jesus and the conspiracy to kill him. I couldn't understand why anyone would murder the Son of God unless genuine ignorance or out-and-out -out insanity had clouded his or her vision. I even wondered if the Lord had spoken to them just one more time, maybe, just maybe, they would have seen their error. Perhaps one more miracle might help them see the truth. A great collective aha would precede their profound apologies and complete acceptance of him as their long-awaited Messiah. He writes, when I outgrew the callow innocence of youth, I accepted a sad yet all too common reality. Some people don't want the truth. The lies they tell themselves make the world theirs to control. At least that's what they've worked hard to believe. And they will destroy anyone who threatens to tear their fantasy worlds apart because they're terrified to face the truth that we are, in fact, powerless. 
Can there be a more senseless lie than the one we tell ourselves? In describing the last days of Jesus' public ministry in Jerusalem, John's matter of fact tone underscores a terrifying reality. The religious leaders had willfully rejected the truth of Jesus Christ, so he gave them over to their self delusion. Theologians have a term for this, they call it judicial abandonment. And this tough love decision on the part of God is not a passive releasing, but an act of giving over for the purpose of redemption. Understand this, please, because a lot of people believe that God lets people sin. But hear this. When the Lord hands someone over to his or her sin, you can be sure of this. The consequences are grave. It is a defining moment in which a person will either break down in repentance or remain stubbornly rebellious, even in the face of damnation. By way of application, Chuck Swindoll says he only has one point. Seek the truths you most fear to find. They hold the greatest promise of freedom and the greatest or gravest threat of destruction. So this prompts several searching questions. And when we're finished this, I'll close in prayer and we'll stop recording and we'll, we can talk about this. So please ponder each one seriously. What truths have you been resisting? What voice have you been silencing or keeping at a distance to avoid hearing what you instinctively know to be true? How has the Lord confronted you lately? Have you drowned out your own conscience with activity or work or relationships or some other kind of escape? And do you ignore the inner voice of reason warning you to stop some behavior that you know to be wrong? Swindoll says, I urge you to answer each question honestly. Heed the truth. Choose the freedom it brings or unimaginable destruction will certainly follow. Now that takes us to the end of John 11. So I'm going to leave John 12 for next time. I'll stop recording after prayer and we can talk about those questions. Father, May this time together, short though it is, be a time, Lord, when we would look to you, when we would examine our hearts, examine what Jesus did for us, and what you offer to us freely. God, may we turn to you in all ways for all things in our lives, that we would receive the freedom that you offer. We thank you and we praise you. In the holy name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.